I'm Jesse Wozniak, an associate professor of sociology at West Virginia University. Uh, I actually just finished writing a book called Policing Iraq, Legitimacy, Democracy, and Empire in a Developing State. It'll be available this March from the University of California Press. It's about my ongoing research in the Kurdish region of Iraq, specifically focusing on the reconstruction of the police force there. The central argument of the book is that we need to look at how what police are designed to actually do, rather than what they are theoretically supposed to do. Uh, and today I want to discuss quickly how what is happening in Iraq helps explain what is happening in America, uh, as well as why police abolition has become such a rallying call. The first question people tend to ask me about Iraq is why police reconstruction isn't going well, and, and why things never seem to improve. Now, I lay out the many reasons for this in, in quite a bit of detail in the book, but a central takeaway is that the reconstruction of the Iraqi police force is actually going rather well. It's just not designed to produce a functional democratic police force. The only way to understand the role of police is to understand the role of power. In the case of Iraqi police, it means understanding the imperial power of the United States. Uh, from the way the Iraqi police force was designed, to the way the police have been trained and, and funded, to the ways they are deployed by the current government, to larger questions of geopolitical interests of America within Iraq and beyond, it becomes quite clear the point of this institution was not to defend the democratic rights of the citizens of Iraq or protect them from harm. Now, of course, while public pronouncements by the police and, and those who design them posit them as a democratic force, everything they are designed to do and trained to do centers on the violent repression of people. So although, while they still have a great deal of difficulty establishing meaningful crime control, the police have been pretty successful in putting down potential rebellions and quashing demonstrations. Thus, while they're not serving the interests of the Iraqi public very much at all, they are very much serving the interests of the United States, the, the sort of power broker within this, uh, this scheme. This is why the endless series of reforms have not made much of a difference at all. These reforms are fundamentally misunderstanding the actual purpose of the police reconstruction in Iraq, which is to help defend American interests. So what does this teach us about American policing? Well, quite a bit especially for what it illustrates about the connection between policing and the larger goals of a state. Now, not surprisingly, there are a wide variety of arguments as to how police support the goals of the state. To get a great rundown of them, read chapter two of my book. Now, they run the gamut from the sort of Pollyanna-ish of, you know, the state exists to provide sunshine and joy, and the police are what it uses to keep everyone safe, uh, to the critical variety of the state exists to enshrine exploitation, uh, and the police are what it uses to keep everyone from rising up and challenging it. And then, of course, all other sorts of positions that fall uh, somewhere between these two poles. Um, as you can guess from the way I presented that, I, I come from this critical view, uh, which is that police exist as a barrier between those with power and those without. And that their actual material purpose is to enforce boundaries of race, class, and other significant social hierarchies. Uh, in other words, they exist to protect power, and everything else they do is subsidiary to that function. So in this, I reject not only sort of the official uh, pronouncements of police departments themselves as to what their duties are, but also more mainstream variants of sociological and criminological thought, which posit the police as serving sort of important central public functions primarily. But you don't have to simply accept my argument. You need only compare the arguments of police forces and mainstream academics to the actual behaviors of police officers and departments. Uh, in, in looking at the actual behaviors of American police, we can see how the critical understanding so better explains what they're doing. If you remember back a million years ago to late April and early May, before the murder of George Floyd by four Minneapolis police officers, the protest movements of the day were anti-mask. Most notoriously, in Michigan, heavily armed anti-mask demonstrators even successfully shut down the state house. Again, while I don't have time or space to summarize every major theoretical view on policing here, pretty much every one of them would hold that a group of armed rebels seizing the legislature in an attempt to shut down legitimate government functioning is exactly the kind of thing police are supposed to prevent or at least end as quickly as possible. By every mainstream definition of what police are and why they exist, uh, it, preventing armed insurrection against the legitimately elected government is right in their wheelhouse. And yet, as so many have pointed out, not only did police neither prevent nor shut down this armed insurrection, they more or less just hung out and watched it happen. Again, if you were to rely on official police pronouncements of their roles and duties or the theories of most mainstream sociologists and criminologists, this response is very difficult to explain. These demonstrators, without masks or maintaining social distance in the midst of a pandemic, were putting lives directly in danger. Even without the threat of a global pandemic, 
They were a group of people with extremely dangerous weapons who were either directly breaking the law or threatening to do so, directly threatening both the public and the legislators, and of course, directly preventing a legitimately elected government from convening. Again, if you listen to mainstream academics or the police themselves, this is the platonic ideal of a situation that police should be shutting down. So it only becomes possible to understand the police response to the Michigan State House demonstrators, again, if you understand the role of power in policing. In the case of American police, this means understanding the role of white supremacy. Put simply, the police in America don't exist to serve and protect the public. They exist to maintain capitalism, white supremacy, and other important social hierarchies. Of course the police occasionally serve the public. They have to, to maintain any form of legitimacy. But the purpose, the function, is and always has been to ensure capitalistic white supremacy. This has historically been quite obvious. Witness how many early police forces in America were simply slave patrols turned public police, or, you know, Google any picture from the civil rights movement. But it also shows up in the much more subtle way of, say, continually harassing black people for things that are either not illegal, or which are routinely ignored if they're done by white people. Or, you can see it in comparing the passive response of police to armed militants taking over the Michigan State House to their brutal nationwide response to Black Lives Matter protests. Again, there's really no existing mainstream idea or theory of why police exist and what functions they serve that explain these disparate reactions. I mean this quite genuinely. Using any official pr pronouncement of what police are or what they do, or most any mainstream theoretical account, uh, of what police are do, it, it's very difficult to understand these two responses. The only possible idea these theories have to offer is that these are isolated incidents of the police failing to do what they theoretically usually do. Yet these theories have exactly zero explanations as to why these isolated incidents keep happening and police keep failing to do what they theoretically usually do. And this is important not just to score points for the theoretical school I inhibit, but because if we are ever to move past the current state of affairs, we have to understand what is happening. Because if one accepts the critical view of police as existing to preserve and defend enshrined power relations, well, it suddenly becomes quite easy to explain these differing responses. Because again, in the American context, enshrined power relations has always meant white supremacy. So if you understand the role of police is to preserve and defend white supremacy, Suddenly, the differing responses in Lansing and Minneapolis and beyond are so obvious as to be banal. The demonstrators in Lansing didn't threaten white supremacy. They were, in fact, upset that the social distancing regulations still applied to them, even though they're white. If anything, their central message was that white supremacy wasn't being defended well enough. Demonstrators in Minneapolis, despite being unarmed, were met with tear gas and rubber bullets because their argument was that white supremacy is bad. And while I can give you a bunch of complicated sounding theory and data to back up that point, it more or less is that simple. Understanding the role of police in protecting entrenched power and white supremacy is important not just for understanding why I say these Lansing protests are met with shrugs and Black Lives Matter protests are met with extreme force all around the nation, but also for understanding where we need to go from here. Because in the next few months, we'll continue to hear lots of calls for reforms. Uh, for more training, for implicit bias awareness, for cultural sensitivity, and all the many other calls we hear every time this disgustingly common occurrence happens. The fundamental problem with these well-meaning calls for reform is they're based upon these theories I, I reject here, right? That is, calls for reform are based on the idea that the goal, the function of police, is to serve the public. But to accept that, you don't have to accept the underlying premise of those theories, which is that each of these incidents is in an isolated event, and it is simply a coincidence that so many keep happening and that the victims, or non-victims, all sharing obvious similarities is another astounding coincidence. But given that these ideas are demonstrably false, they make for an extremely poor basis for future action. Indeed, with a proper understanding of the police as a force principally concerned with defending social hierarchies and defending white supremacy, it becomes clear why any amount of reform and new kinds of training are bound to fail, and indeed why all such previous efforts have produced pretty minimal changes so far. Similar to the Iraqi case, these reform efforts fail not because they're uh, not fixing the police force correctly, but because they misunderstand the actual purpose of policing in that context. And this is why abolition remains such a central goal. No amount of reform is going to work when an entire institution is designed to deliver a specific outcome.